Members of the public and uh, and uh, Mr. Henry from the media. You know, we've got a bit of volume issue here. Right, uh, could I ask Dave Pipe to take us through the prayer, please? O oh God, our Creator, bless us as we gather today for this meeting. Guide our minds and our hearts so that we will work for the good of our community and help all your people. Teach us to be generous in our outlook, courageous in face of difficulty, and wise in our decisions. We ask this grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Right. Uh, apologies for the day. There are no apologies. Notices. I have a notice. Um, and I think Mr. Aidy's handed that. You've handed that right round. Okay, field trips just... Um, there has been a, an expression of interest in further field trips and we do have a lot of the regions still to see. So uh, there is a list there, um, some with three with dates and others that we will uh, do as and when the, the opportunity arises. I suspect the Plan Change 6 issue, Tuki Tuk Catchment, may be a, more than half a day but uh, we'll see how that goes, pans out. But just uh, for your notice anyway and information. Oh, right. Whether or not those suit uh, any of those and what the priorities are for the field trips, that would be great. So just liaise, li liaise directly with yeah. you, Mike. Okay, right. right. Very good. Could, could I just make an observation here? <clears throat> I want to say thank you for this, Mike. This is the first time I've had a, a real chance to put some input into dates, which is uh, uh, this is really good. I like this process. I hope we continue it. And I just ask the, when the council's organising uh, meetings, I've noticed a few of them start to shift backwards and forwards across the whole of the week. Uh, whereas I, I think if we set aside a day or two, two Wednesdays are sort of like I put down as uh, council days, and then a lot of meetings are on Tuesdays. So council trips and meetings could be Tuesdays and Wednesdays. It would just be really convenient because you then uh, you can use other days. But if you start shifting to Wednesday, Thursdays and Fridays, it disturbs other things because you can't build a pattern. So could we do that? Okay. Makes some sense. Any other notices? You have a notice? Uh, yes, Mr Chairman. Uh, just Council has been formally advised by the High Court that it will be hearing the um, High Court appeals on Plan Change 6 and the Rotanapa Water Storage Scheme for three days beginning Monday the 10th of November and uh, the cases will be heard in Wellington. 10th of November, thank you. Oh, the notices, conflict of interest declarations. There are none, thank you. Uh, confirmation of the minutes. Very quickly for accuracy, page two, page three, page four, and page five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Well, that's how the numbering goes in my one anyway. Someone happy to move? Uh, Councillor Scott, that they're true and correct. Thank you, Councillor Pipe. Put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, no. Carried. Matters arising from those minutes. Uh, Councillor Barker. I've got one matter. And that uh, relates to the uh, issue between the Council and Councillor Belford, of the complaint that's been raised with him. As I recall, uh, uh, you, Chair, were asked to get uh, advice on whether or not <coughs> uh, the actions complained of about Councillor Belford were in this capacity as a councillor, and I see an email from you the other day, or advice from you, that this was going to be <coughs> running in parallel uh, with, the, uh, with the investigation. I would have thought uh, that it would have been prudent to do these things in sequence, so I would have thought the first thing is to ascertain whether or not <coughs> Councillor Belford was acting as a councillor, and then if that was to be the case, then to pursue, pr pr uh, proceed with the investigation. Uh, so what I'm wanting to know from you is what actions have you taken 
uh, what advice have you sought, where have you gone, uh, to get uh, um, advice on whether or not Councillor Belford, in the issue that was complained of, was acting in the capacity as a councillor, and whether or the alternative, if he was not, the advice is that he was not, then the investigation <coughs> that we're paying a substantial amount of money for is irrelevant, falls away, and we can save the council costs. Sure, well, the, the, the investigation is to determine whether there's a case to answer, full stop. Um, the fact of being a one minute you, you're a councillor, next minute you're not, um, is part of that general discussion. So uh, it's not quite as simple as you lay it out, unfortunately, that, and that's my understanding of it. But I, I thought you were going to go and get advice. Now, and I, I, am getting, I am getting advice. And, and I thought you were that the, that, uh, the lawyers that we have commissioned said they're not going, according to you, have said that they're not competent to make that, that determination and that you were going to get advice. And what I want to know from you is what actions have you taken to get that advice? When can we expect that advice? And where are you getting that advice from? The challenge in, in the way you term that, though, is the, um, the code of conduct is, doesn't differentiate, doesn't give you the ability to differentiate between being a councillor and not a councillor. At all times, you represent the council, correct? Well, well, so, so on that basis, what, you, what you're asking is, um, you know, as I've gotten further into it, what you're asking becomes, it's, it's not irrelevant, but it is part of the general discussion about whether there is a case to answer or not. Well, with, with respect, <clears throat> the law, the statute, uh, is superior to our code of conduct. Our code of conduct cannot mend or adapt the statute. And the statute is very clear in the schedule that the, the, that the code of conduct applies when a councillor is acting in their capacity as a councillor. That's it. So for the code of conduct to apply, Mr. Belford, Councillor Belford, must have been acting in his capacity as a councillor. So what we have to now determine before we can apply the code of conduct <clears throat> is determine whether he was acting in his capacity as a councillor or not. Now, the implication you have given me from your previous comment is that we're always acting as councillors. But I would say to you that we are not. And the perfect example is what you've just gone through now is the conflict of interest. If we were always acting as councillors, there would be no conflict of interest. The conflict of interest shows us that we do act in a private capacity. And our co private capacity can come in conflict with our council interest. So we have to declare the conflicts. So it's quite clear that we have two personalities here. One is a councillor, one is a private person. Now, for the code of conduct to apply, the law requires, the law is very specific, that Councillor Belford must be acting as a councillor. Now, what I understood from our last meeting is that you were to seek advice as to whether or not <coughs> Councillor Belford's actions were within the ambit of him acting as a councillor. And as part of the investigation, if, if you go back to the, um, to the blog piece that, that is in question, um, there is a discussion around, um, you know, he names, we're all named in it as councillors, including Councillor Belford, right? So we, we need to get through that piece of the puzzle before we get down to a more, if you like, a more simple explanation that you're seeking here. Well, so I'm happy to let it run its course. I, I'm actually not that happy we have to go through all this for, for what it... For, for what's at stake here, we need we need some definition in the answer, and, well, and that's what I'm seeking. I'd like to make a comment on this. Um, I'm surprised at how well Councillor Barker, not being a lawyer, has summarised the law, but he's absolutely right. There cannot be a code of conduct complaint here that has any basis for further um, discussion or um, investigation on either our part or anybody that we employ to do it, unless there's a prima facie case made, and it's included in our code of conduct, um, whereby the, the councillor's comments were made in his capacity as a councillor. And if you're not seeking advice on that, then you're not going to get to a satisfactory conclusion. Well, it, you and, have to do this. And, as, and I'll repeat what I said, in, in the particular discussion that we're having in this particular instance, part of the investigation, that, that will come out in this particular instance. 
because we're all named as councillors in the, in the blog piece. It, it's pretty straightforward. In fact, I'm, we're starting to waste time here, guys. No, I just, I, we're not wasting time. This is really important. <clears throat> this is really important. This is, this, is, this is really important, that make no mistake about that. <clears throat> there are, <clears throat> I've watched the email traffic, and, and as I understand it, the advice you gave me in the email the other day was that <clears throat> our lawyers are not going to uh, give a determination, that the investigation, on that particular aspect of it. That's what I understood from the email traffic that you put forward before. Well, that, that, that's your interpretation of it. Chief is here. Could, could I perhaps answer this? And, um, uh, in preparation for this, I actually went back to the webcast of the uh, last council meeting when this was actually discussed to just really refresh my memory as to how this was uh, discussed and, and determined. And there actually, there's actually two separate issues here, and I think that they've both been um, uh, brought together, perhaps uh, unnecessarily. There was a general discussion about when a person is acting in their role as a councillor and when they are acting or speaking uh, as an individual and there was a request made that there be some clarification provided around that so that's let's park that that's that's one piece of work the other piece of work was around the specific code of conduct complaint that had been received and the code of conduct uh, itself which was uh, discussed and amended with that appendix around a particular process and it was uh, decided that this particular uh, complaint would run through the course of the process that had been adopted using an, an independent person uh, because in fact you were all named in the blog. So. Um, it was quite clear that, that that would be done there. Now, now the role of that independent person is to first of all determine whether or not there is a case to answer. And that's the first part of his job. Uh, and he's trying to work through that at the moment with both the, both the, the complainant and the respondent. Well, well could I just make, make two other follow-up points. Firstly, the expertise on this question does not rest here in Hawke's Bay. The local government of New Zealand has a very good law f uh, legal team. They have been really experienced in all of this, and I would trust their advice ahead of any other advice I got here in this, in this, in this area, because they have dealt with it for uh, many, many years. <clears throat> and uh, they would be the experts. Uh, uh, a provincial law firm, I would say to you, uh, would do very little on this. The second point, I, I, I want to make about this is that <clears throat> uh, while Liz is correct that we did the two things s separately, they are two separate things, I would have thought the first one to establish whether or not the person was acting in their capacity was the first step in the chain. The second, if that was proven to be the case, then the investigation continues. And I just give you the analogy, <clears throat> I'm clocked doing 70 kilometres an hour. The charge is I'm breaking the speed limit. But the first point you have to do is, was I in actually in a restricted speed zone? You don't go and work out how fast I was going or not going, and then subsequently work out whether I was in a restricted speed zone. You start at the beginning. Was I in a restricted speed zone? Yes or no? If it's no, then the issue falls away. Now, it seems to me that we've got this, we've conjoint these, conflated these things, and we're not dealing with it in a logical way. Well, I, I can't deal with it right here right now. I'll, I'll note what you're saying, obviously it's recorded and uh, let's, let's have a chat with, our, with, the, with the person that's doing the work and, and if there is a, a subsequent piece of work that has to happen before that, I will follow that up. So thank you. Councillor Belford. Mr Chairman, I wouldn't take the further time with the Council on this but for the fact that you did send uh, everyone an email that makes pretty clear that, that Mr Chan feels that this is not uh, a, an aspect of the matter for him to decide uh, and you go on to say that, that you are seeking uh, advice from someone else uh, on the matter. I've indicated to you and you did not have the courtesy of replying that uh, uh, I have no intention of putting any time into defending myself uh, on the complaint until a decision has been made as to whether the, the complaint has any standing uh, in effect, uh, as Councillor Barker is, is suggesting. 
So just so that counselors are aware of what the situation is, that is the situation. Okay. Uh, and until we've determined whether I was in a speed zone or not, uh, I'm not going to... Uh, I, I think we'll all agree it's an ongoing matter and uh, let me deal with it. Yeah, okay. Any other matters arising? Thank you, Councillor Belford. Any other matters arising from the minutes? Uh, Councillor Hewitt. Just with regard to the the um, meeting that I requested or the briefing from the staff on the four-wheel drive river access in Central Hawke's Bay and <coughs> just reporting back to Council that we had a, a pretty productive very first meeting and we have a follow-up meeting for affected parties on the 18th of September. Oh, okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, report from the Māori Committee Chairman, the meeting held 26th of August. Fresh in your mind, uh, Chairman Mohi. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, very good meeting yesterday. Um, one of the agenda items was a, um, a preamble to what will be a, a collective hapu management plan uh, by um, Heratanga Taifenua. Uh, supported by Komatua uh, Jerry um, uh, Hapuku, uh, sorry, Hapuku and Tom Mulligan, um, which um, it just sort of humbled the committee a bit to see the, um, the support from those uh, two, two Komatua. Um, I'm just trying to get this into context, I've got so much here. Um, if I could just um, reflect back to um, the workshop um, and the uh, the paper on relationship with Māori, um, uh, presented by Helen Coglin and co-authored by uh, Councillor Graham, um, there was a number of um, comments there that um, that were discussed uh, by the Māori committee. And um, it, it was decided that um, we would um, form a subcommittee um, to bring back a paper to the uh, to the council laws. Um, it's uh, it was also um, suggested that um, at the next workshop um, uh, sooner rather than later that a full day be set aside for um, a treaty. Treaty of Waitangi type workshop to be, um, um, I was going to say authored, uh, to be run by um, Roger Marker, who's one of the members of the committee. He um, has been forwarded um, uh, a whole workshop uh, scenario from um, Mr. Constantine, uh, who's now retired, and he's been doing that for a strong Irishman. Um, from Christchurch, been doing that for the last 30 or so years and a close uh, uh, friend of Roger Marker. So that was suggested. Um, and this sort of came about um, with a meeting of um, senior members of the Maori Committee um, regards uh, the comments uh, from the last planning committee um, where uh, it was suggested that some members are struggling to so-called come up to speed and so rather than take offence at that, it was um, thought, um, what could we, we do to, um, to bring so-called Māori members up to speed? But it was actually suggested um, that the running of a treaty workshop would indeed bring the councillors up to speed. Um, so it's sort of looking at things slightly differently. Um, uh, and so the councillors were aware of Māori procedures as well as uh, procedures in terms of plan changes, etc. And one of the major things that come out of uh, the suggestions was the need to to have uh, in council staff second tier uh, Māori manager, and indeed a senior Māori advisor to. Um, I was going to say the department to the council. A, um, 
Yeah, and as I said, there's um, a lot of these things that were discussed um, in the papers. Um, it was suggested that um, the subcommittee from the Māori Committee could present something if indeed there, it, it was going to be passed on at a, um, a workshop type thing. Um, also, um, uh, three Mana Ahuriri members uh, didn't um, sent their apology in yesterday. They, the very well known person died, and um, I attended the Tangi yesterday afternoon. So the um, Mana, Mana Ahuriri members were all involved with that. Um, also, um, our committee realised that um, uh, Mr. Pretty Prentice has been um, uh, unable to attend the Corporate and Strategic Management Committee due to his um, uh, continual working with the uh, Mana Ahuriri claim process and it was um, uh, suggested that uh, Mr Mike Paku replace Mr Prentice and that would be um, need to be confirmed uh, by this committee. Um, yeah, just uh, any questions, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, so, just just to follow up on that last point, so we you're seeking uh, council endorsement of Mr. Paku to replace um, Mr. Prentice? Yes. Okay. Just, could, could we could we do that here? Uh, you're happy to move that we do that? Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. Thank you, Councillor Pipe. I'll put that. Oh, I'll, I'll put that motion. Then we'll get back to the discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, no. Thank you. Carried. Um, and I had another question for you, Mr. Mohi. Oh, Mana Ake. Um, just for everyone's interest, that was the beginning of your discussion. Mm. Um, when would we hope to see that final product? Well, you know, or, this or is a document. And, and just to explain, it's a holistic view of uh, of all the marae, um, but it has some hapu, direct hapu influence in it as well. My understanding, and it's about a management plan, basically. Yes, yeah, so it was originally suggested years ago by the, this council that each hapu have a management plan and presented to the um, to the council. And I'll ask um, the CEO to explain the process, but. Um, because the marae, the various marae and hapu overlap, um, it was how, how are we going to get something that actually um, suited everybody rather than sort of struggling with one another. And indeed, there's probably only been a handful of hapu management plans. So um, Heratonga said to the various hapu in their um, rohe, look, we'll do a big one and put it all in together so it makes a little bit of collective sense. So that's where it comes from. It's probably um, two or three months away from being finalised. My understanding is that it will firstly come to um, the Māori Committee. So I'll hand it over to the CEO to explain the process. Thank you. Um, so actually just to give you uh, councillors a bit of background, back in 2009, um, Regional Council was working with the Heratonga Tai Whenua to try and assist them or to provide some resourcing for them to be able to, I guess, build capacity to prepare happy management plans. Um, these management plans are very um, uh, useful from a council perspective uh, when we're dealing with resource consents and with uh, development of plan policy. And certainly from a, a, a hapu or marae uh, perspective, they're extremely useful for them to be able to have in written format, I guess, their, their um, their, their desired direction and, and their values. Um, so we uh, uh, entered into a three-year agreement with the Tai Whenua uh, in, in which we funded uh, essentially uh, Dale's position and also additional resourcing to allow them to work with the hapu. And, um, and, and they began that journey uh, and then uh, came to realise that actually there were so many issues in common that it uh, was really probably made most sense for them to be able to pull together one document, which is where we've got to with Mana Ake. So the council is certainly very pleased to have been uh, a part of that, uh, creating that ability for them to be able to do that. When the document comes to the council, it, as uh, Mike has explained, it will come to the Māori Committee. Uh, it will then be referred up to um, uh, our policy team, and they will just do it because there are some Resource Management Act um, uh, matters that they need to, to be clear on 
and just to, to really just, if necessary, perhaps clarify with uh, the Tai Whenua um, about some of the intent, and then it will come to Council for final adoption. So it will then be uh, adopted as a document that this Council has to take into account when it's considering uh, its plan development, uh, and also um, uh, obviously individually when there's perhaps a resource consent application in an area. And if I may just go back to the Māori agenda yesterday, uh, there were some excellent items from staff. And um, in just reflecting back on the concerns of uh, the council laws at the management committee that um, some Māori uh, are struggling to keep up to speed uh, in agreeing with that comment, um, it's, it needs to be attacked on several fronts. And um, what I would like to see also that there is... Um, a currently running an environmental course uh, run by one of the EIT, the Wanana, out of Hawke's Bay. I, I would like to see, invite the staff to give a similar talk to those um, young trainees. And um, uh, Tamatia have actually got a, uh, a grant for one person, or a $50,000 grant for the next 70 years for one person uh, inflation uh, adjusted, of course, um, to do eco environment training. And what we would like to see is that the council sort of match that. So what w what we're envisaging that this la um, lack of understanding, as, as, as it were, of procedures is attacked on several fronts, not just um, upskilling the, um, the ones that are sort of slightly older, like myself, but um, also the young ones. So that would be discussed um, in a proposed workshop. Right, any questions for Mr. Mohi? Any of the uh, members who were part of the Māori Committee, any comments to make before we go to a recommendation to receive that verbal report? There's a couple of points <clears throat> I'd like to make. Uh, <clears throat> firstly, yeah, I, I really like the idea of us uh, investing in uh, my relationship in the form of staff and resources. I think we should. <clears throat> I think it's uh, a very good thing to do and uh, it's the right thing to do and it'll, it will prove long-term benefits. <clears throat> the second thing is that we had a, <clears throat> a discussion yesterday about uh, uh, putting our history uh, on, on parks and so on that we have and a resolution was passed out. I think that's the responsibility that the council should take itself and not to, not to actually uh, write a history for Māori, but we should fund and resource it. We shouldn't just take it for granted. So we should fund and resource that to make sure it happens. That's a responsibility we should have. And the, the third thing I'd like to comment on is, I'm not sure I'm quite up to this yet on the, uh, uh, but there was some discussion at uh, the planning, Regional Planning Committee <clears throat> about the interconnectedness of things. And uh, we seem to have you know, some pieces here and some there. And it seemed to me that the most logical and obvious thing to do to ensure that all of these things were connected was to have <clears throat> uh, 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 Mike Mohi as a, de facto, as a person on each and every committee that we had as of right. Access to the minutes, access to everything, full and participating. Because at the moment we just have uh, Māori engagement at the Regional Council, at this table here. <clears throat> we have them at the Regional Planning Committee. Uh, but all of the other committees, there's no automatic right. And I think we should resolve that. I think that uh, we should make <coughs> uh, uh, Mike Mohi ex officio or acting full participating member of every committee that this council has. Just regardless. remind you that they, they do have rep representation uh, through the Tai Whenua on our other committees. Uh, there's two two members uh, elected from the Māori Committee on, on our Environment Services and Corporate Strategic Committee. But, but the, I, I get that, but it's sort of like segmentation, you with me? There's a group here and a group there, and I just think it needs uh, something to tie it all together, someone with an overview, a holistic overview. Each of us has access automatically to every meeting we can go to, mm. and we're fully engaged, and therefore we have a, a full, full picture. But to have people come in for this meeting, and then come in for another meeting, and then come up for a second meeting somewhere else, <clears throat> means the view is fragmented. And I think it's an issue. I think it needs to be resolved. And I think the simplest way of resolving it is for us to consider uh, a resolution at the next meeting of making uh, uh, Mike Mohi uh, ex officio a part of every committee that we have 
uh, regardless of who else comes. So we have two Tofanova people, that's great. We have two mm. Tofanova people and Mike. Uh, we have some other people, we have them and Mike. I just think we should uh, uh, share him around. It should be a bite <laughs> everywhere. All right, well, let's, let's further consideration. Any other questions, Mr. Mohi? Any, some, someone like to, oh, uh, Councillor Dick. Well, I'd, I'd certainly support um, some consideration of the uh, uh, proposal from Councillor Barker. Um, Mr. Mohi is a, an invaluable part of this institution and um, his uh, relationships and networks um, make things work, but they can be made to work even better. So I think it would be a very good idea for uh, staff to work up some option there. I'm not sure about the notion of um, two Taifenua plus Mr Mohi, um, but maybe it could be one Taifenua plus Mr, Mr Mohi that would work. And he, he was telling me he's looking forward to all the extra reading. So, what, <laughs> the extra reading, Mr. Chair. Um, I also support that. It would need to be the chair of the Murray committee because Mr. Mohi's aging and he won't be with us forever. <laughs> I thought he looked good. Question, th chair. Thought he looked good for fifty-five. Yeah, question: can, Do you wish it to be uh, just a process thing here? Should it be left to me to put a resolution next time, or should we rely? on the Chief Executive having got the point to come back with the paper next time. I'm happy and, either way. And have a discussion with Mr Mohi about yeah. what, what the appropriate wording and what it should look like. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. can we leave it in the hands of the Chief Executive to come yeah. with another paper? That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Someone happy to move that we accept that report. Uh, thank you. Councillor Barker, seconded Councillor Graham. I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, no. Carried. Thank you.